what I said is that uh, good afternoon, my friends and family that uh, we're here to talk about the Buyum Puyuk, um, Tawal Mim, which is the mountain waters uh, that are sacred that come down throughout the valley to um, the ocean. And what does that have to do with the climate change and the understanding that uh, people need to catch up with what Mother Nature already built, already designed, already made it perfect for us to live here on this land. And uh, we have done a number of things as people, creating this society as it is now, where money have been coming uh, more important even than water. Even though most of us know from our own experience and our history that no life can continue without pure, good water, including ours. And why we choose to jeopardize that basic knowledge still is a wonder. Why people would think that money is a better way to go than protecting the rights of the water. And, um, you know, I'm from a mountain where uh, we drink water directly from the source. It's not, you know, filtered or uh, anything happens to it, no chlorine, no uh, fluoride. Um, and I think that most people haven't a clue what real water tastes like. And I'm sad to say that your water here really tastes different. It's a taste that I don't really like. And it looks like water. It feels like water. But for us, it probably isn't water. It's something else. It's a wet liquid. Uh, it, you know, it's some sort of a, a odd tea, it seems like to me. So uh, <laughs> that's part of the issues that we're facing is that not enough people have a memory that goes back to a time when you could drink from a spring or a stream or a river. And right now, the common knowledge is that you can't. That if you go hiking even to the pristine waters in the mountains, that you should carry your water in, or you should have a filtering system, or you should boil it or something you need to do to the water. And all of this still doesn't bring about um, like a, like people to be upset with it. And instead, we're so complacent that we accept it. It's just the way it is. Instead of being appalled that it's turned this way and that we should be doing something about it. And instead, we say we can't do anything about it because we can't change. We can't change it the way that it's been the way that things have happened to the water. Yet we know nothing exists without water. And it's a very, very short time that you can exist without water. You know, you might live, what, 14 days, 15 days, if you're really strong, without water. And so it's a, it's a, uh, a kind of an odd thing to me that so many millions of people have become complacent about the water issues in California. You know, we're in drought, we've been in drought for a very long time, yet uh, we're still fracking. We're still building new fracking industry. And we know that fracked water cannot be used again. Do we have enough water to have one more fracking mine before it tilts? And we're fighting for drinking water, which I think that we're fighting for drinking water now. Yet we're not strong enough uh, to make those changes and maybe not quick enough. Because, you know, we're fighting against Crystal Geyser on Mount Shasta from taking more water from a volcanic aquifer. No science knows 
what happens to an aquifer that is uh, surrounding a volcano or the temperature changes when you draft off unlimited amounts of cold water pool from a volcano. You know, and maybe there'll be some people who live beyond that who can go and study it and come up with the result of what happened when they drafted off too much water from a volcano. But do we want to go there? Do we really want that? You know, I think not. I think that Creator put that together uh, in a way that is supposed to warn us. You know, when, when the volcanoes explode, uh, for us, that's in our storytelling is, is that that is a sign that we need to make some changes in what we're doing. Not just a coincidence, not just a seismic activity of the earth, but it is the voice of the earth telling us, giving us a chance, you know, uh, to make some changes. And same with the earthquakes. The earthquakes are telling us about fracking that we should stop that because here it comes, you know, here comes these earthquakes. They're telling us, and, and we're looking at it, and the scientists are already relating fracking activity to a, a number of in, increased earthquakes, uh, including in Humboldt County. I mean, how many of you know how many fracking mines are in California? Yeah, there's thousands. Yeah. They're in places that you don't even know that they are. And they're considered um, clean energy, yet uh, just like nuclear power is considered clean energy, and so is coal considered clean energy. Yet the water that is used in these processes, um, they have no idea and no way to fix it. They can't, it's not even like a, a sewer system. A sewer system, you can change and you can filter it out and you can make that water drinkable again by all, because that's what Mother Nature does. It has a process of filtering out and changing and, and giving back to these um, underground aquifers clean water to be stored for uh, every living thing. But fracking water um, is not going to do that. You can't reuse it. You can't do anything with it. And so I think, you know, as we go along, uh, people have to get more knowledge about the processes that are happening and about the effects. Because uh, while we rely on science a great deal to protect us to some degree on these new projects or new things that are being built or uh, exercised, that we have to start asking the questions. How much water in California are we polluting every day? I mean, taking clean, drinkable water, and we convert it to contaminated water. What's the amount every day, every hour? Do we know that? We don't know that. They don't talk about it, right? But in their EIRs, they have to say how many gallons of water will be used and how many gallons of water will be a waste, wastewater they call it. They don't call it contaminated, poison, toxic water, which they should call it because it's more than wastewater. But we don't know, we don't keep track of all of these projects that are happening throughout our state uh, and we, we become complacent about water. Just like with Crystal Geyser, Nestle's and all of those who are tapping into our systems of water bottling it up, leaving the other half contaminated water for us to deal with, and shipping the water to other countries from a state that is in drought. Why do we allow that? You know, because we don't know or because it's just, you know, we have to share our water with everybody in the world, and uh, we're getting some sort of a benefit from it. You know, I don't see that. I see Nestle's getting rich and richer and doing things that Switzerland would not let them do there. But they come to these countries, they come to these communities that are maybe less educated about water laws, and they exercise a power uh, to extract water for the sales 
everywhere. So they just get richer and richer. You know, uh, Crystal Geyser <laughs> advertises on their uh, website for Mount Shasta that they're going to be selling flavored waters. Yeah, flavored waters are going to come out of Mount Shasta. It's like, really? <laughs> And I did talk with the president of the bottle watering industry out of Washington, D.C., and I said to him, we drink straight from the springs on Mount Shasta. It doesn't go through any processes. Even the town has no real filtration system for their homes. They drink straight from the source. And I said, what do you do to the bottle water when you extract it? Well, the first thing they do is they put the uh, disinfectant in the water. And it's like, what would you be disinfecting when all of the people here just drink it straight from the source? So you're taking pristine water, you're contaminating it with disinfectant, and then you're adding something to it, and then you're selling it as spring water. It's like, and we buy it, right? We have no idea that... Uh, you know, you can buy Nestle's product here in California that's made from Mount Shasta or somewhere else, and you can buy the same thing in Poland, and those two waters will taste the same because the customers expect it to taste the same. Whether or not you get it in Guatemala or Ecuador or anywhere, it's going to taste the same. Every bottle of water tastes the same. So if it's going to taste the same, why are we destroying all these springs and mountain systems? Uh, to extract this water for bottling to, to sell, you know. Uh, it's a problem that we need to wake up to. There are many situations that we need to wake up to. Our, our college systems need to start talking about it. Our students need to be starting to uh, have rationality about um, the water issues. You know, um, 30 years ago, um, my gram said that water will be so scarce that so many diseases will come from it because the water will be so low and contaminated that the people won't know what to do about it. There'll, there'll be respiratory systems that are affected by these water uh, problems. And we're going into it um, like frogs in a pot. You know, uh, I don't know if you know that frogs in a pot uh, that term means that if there's a frog in the water and the water begins to warm, the frog doesn't notice until he's dead. But you put a frog in hot water and they're going to jump. Right? Otherwise, it's just gradually happening and we don't recognize it. That's what's happening to the people. All of this gradual stuff uh, that's happening with our water, our air, and we're convinced that we can't live without it. When in fact... Uh, we have before. You know, all of the communities have lived in, at some point in time without all of the um, commodities and without all of the modernization of comfort. And there's something to be said about uh, societies that are built for their environments uh, survive. Meaning, like in the Arctic, People in the Arctic have knowledge and technology and systems in place that they can continue to exist there. But if we went up there in the Arctic, chances are we, we probably will not know and our bodies are not conditioned to be any colder than, you know, what, what is it, 70 degrees, 68 degrees? Because that's where you turn down your air conditioners to 68 or 65 degrees, you know? and. Um, and when then we turn it up, it's like, okay, 70 degrees or 75 degrees. And we have this very short range of living condition that we can tolerate. And we've, we've given this to generations of us, right? So if it really gets too cold, we lose a lot of people to uh, storms and weather, weather changes, um, icing of towns that shut down their systems. Uh, most people don't know how to get along. You know, if you shut down all the supermarkets, most people won't know of a food source, you know. But we don't know how vulnerable that we are, and we don't want to think that that would ever, ever end. That'll never stop. But our water systems, you know, uh, we have these exotic things like water bottling 
But then we also have food processing, like uh, growing all of these products for the domesticated animals. You know, they take more water than not for pigs and, and cows and alfalfa and corn to, to feed them. While we're convinced that we have to do these water projects in California because people don't have drinking water. It's like we have a whole array of things that need to be fixed and changed, and we have the technology that could change it to a better way, uh, but we don't use it because I'm thinking the people who get the money from these sources is a handful of people who have convinced everybody else that uh, they have to have it this way. And we're not willing to take a risk that they might uh, be lying <laughs> Right? But at one point in time, like I said earlier, uh, many, many families and houses and farms were off grid. And they survived and they had healthier food when they canned their own peaches, they canned their own tomatoes. They had real food. And nowadays, you know, you're buying food that's uh, full of preservatives, full of sugar, full of uh, corn syrup, you know. Um, which isn't as healthy for us, but we're convinced that we can live longer, right, if we eat like that. Um, but for, um, for the environment itself, uh, we have to establish a relationship, I think. Everybody needs to have a relationship with your environment. When you're in a, what, I, what Grams would call a stagnant environment is one that has exotic flowers and uh, lawns that they don't know anything. And, and those people who only go to groomed parks as their outdoor recreation um, idea, that um, there are no stickers there, there's no, twi you know, everything is so groomed that children playing in these places uh, certainly probably are safe, but are they learning anything about their environment? I mean, uh, most kids don't know what the smell of dry grass smells like. They have no clue. They have no clue what the uh, native plants are here, or what's edible, what's not edible, what's a weed, what, what came in. You know, we don't, we don't have that knowledge per se. But maybe we should, you know, start thinking about our own levels of the future, you know, like my grandma said when she um, was much older, she said, you know, I do these things for my seven generations. My time here is up. Whatever happens now, you know, isn't going to affect me. I'm going to be gone. It's all of you kids and your kids as kids that's going to be here and have to, have to figure out what, what they could do. But I think that, you know, if we don't look around and start getting some practical knowledge, like I was saying about the little white butterfly in the pine tree, you know, people go to the, go to the recreational areas to enjoy the woods, the forest, to go, go camping up on Lake Shasta, you know, but a lot of those campers, they come in with these big RVs in their motorboat, in their uh, motorcycle, and their TV uh, antenna on their rig, and that's uh, recreating, right? They have their bicycle, uh, and they're recreating in the forest. But really, they're not, they're not understanding that this pine tree that's uh, leaking all this pitch, that that pitch is a medicine. And that, you know, nothing like that is, is really uh, a part of their experience other than seeing a tree, you know? And it's seeing a tree in a different way, like seeing a picture of a tree. Whereas if you're there in the mountains, you would know that the snow melts first around the bottom of the tree. And you would know that um, trees will look half white and half green in, in the wintertime. And so when you draw pictures of trees, uh, you don't see anybody drawing a picture of a half-white tree because on the shaded side of the tree, it's still frozen. It still has the white dust of the snow. And on the sun side, it's all melted and it's green. But who notices 
that kind of detail uh, when you're out in the woods, when you're, when you're experiencing the Mother Nature's way of working to provide all of us with what we need, you know, with the air that we need, with the, the waters that we need. You know, they're just now starting to study the root system of the trees. And I did hear that they were going to go and cut a lot of trees down because they thought the trees were using too much water. It was like, oh my gosh, we have a long way to go. <laughs> but what, whatever you see on the top of the ground is in the ground under that tree. And the root systems are entwined with each other to hold themselves up in the communities of the trees. And yet we don't, we don't realize that, you know. We're, uh, we're into renewable resources and we can just plant those things and, and we still have them. Yet we don't recognize that what we're doing is planting an orchard in the forest. We have an orchard of trees that are going to be the same size, grow the same height, uh, be knocked down the same time, and they're not really a forest. You know, it's not where the birds and everything chooses to live. When you have a forest, you also have all of those things that are choosing to live there because everything there is what they need. But our replanted forests don't provide that. They don't provide that. And we still don't have a policy of areas that we say, we're going to let them grow for 100 years before we cut them. 100 years. It's like 40 years and they're coming back to cut them. Um, but we don't recognize that we came from a state that had these huge trees. You know, even in our area, um, under the lake, when the lake recedes, uh, we see these stumps because they cut all the trees when the dam came in. But we have this one stump that's under... It's an, it's an oak tree that was like 12 and a half feet in diameter. Who sees that anymore? A 12 and a half foot oak at the base of the trunk. It's almost like a, a, a story, right? It's like a make-believe story. It's like the 100-pound salmon. It's like, who sees those anymore? You're making that up. You know, but uh, on Battle Creek, they did find a salmon, in uh, the carcass of a salmon that was 85 pounds. But through our hatchery system, we have created a salmon that's basically the same size, just like we're making these trees the same size. You know, in the early days of the hatchery process, and, and even probably now, it's, it, they don't have that um, diversity, but it was people who milked the male salmon onto the eggs. Well, nobody wanted to lift the 85-pound squirmy, flopping salmon, right? So they lifted the smaller ones. And so they created these generations of smaller salmon by not using the diversity of the large salmon. And now, you know, we have these studies that kind of pin us in uh, that 100-pound, 85-pound salmon are um, pretty rare. But studies don't go back as far as we did, you know? Because when they started, uh, like my dad's generation started seeing the 40-pound salmon as the normal salmon coming up, they were saying how small those salmon are, right? Those salmon are pretty small these days. While everybody else is saying, gee, look how big this fish is, you know, how, how they had to fight it to get it in, all of that, right? But they don't really recognize what was already here or the processes that were already here. And that uh, some way we have to find our way back uh, if we want to if we want to change climate, and we can't really change it. We can only put back what was here that sustained the climate, like our our large trees. We need the large trees, uh, like the wolves. You know, uh, wolves in California are very detrimental to the to the water issues. And maybe you say, why would the wolf be a part of the water system? Well, one, the wolf is a fisherman. But aside from that, uh, he maintains the high mountain meadows. And the way that he does it is that, you know, our meadows nowadays are all being encroached uh, by vegetation because the wolf is not there. When the wolf is uh, uh, present, you don't have the other um, animals who eat grass and stuff encroaching on the meadow, changing um, 
the hydrology of the ground as well as eating all of the plants off and not eating from the edge of the meadow that keeps it wide. When the wolves are there, uh, he's a predator of those animals like deer and rabbit and every, everyone else that goes in to do that. And so they eat on the edges of the meadow because they don't want to be uh, prime dinner, right? And, and they're not impacting uh, the heart of the meadow. It's remained uh, soft and spongy by the voles. And they eat on the edge of the meadow, keeping vegetation from growing into the meadow. That's why he's a water keeper. You know, but all of these things, I, I don't think science has caught up with the effects of um, everybody's jobs. <laughs> everybody's uh, here for a reason that uh, kind of filters into our own life, you know. Uh, like we were telling uh, Peter Moyle yesterday is, is that the Indians on the river and the salmon have stories together. We relied on each other. There is a dependency together. And one of those uh, ways of looking at things is, is that uh, there's always been high water years, wet water years, uh, dry drought years, all of that. But in the drought years, uh, it was the people who had dip netting skills that dip netted the salmon to help them get above the jumps that they couldn't make during a low water year so that they could go to their spawning ground. So there was a basic understanding that you didn't look at the pool and say, hey, look at all those fish for me. You know, you looked at all the fish and saying, oh, those poor fish, they can't get to where they're supposed to be. I have to help them. I can't just take them all and eat them all. I have to help them. And doing that, you know, and, and that's a different way of thinking about things. You know, even in the hunting seasons, it's like uh, there wasn't this uh, trophy hunter kind of, uh, you know, uh, need for the hunters. In fact, it was frowned upon. If you brought back the biggest rack of a deer, it was frowned upon because you have interrupted the generational um, processes of this giant deer to affect all populations behind him. And so uh, large deer like that, the big antlers, they were allowed to walk away. You wouldn't take that one because he's going to produce more large deer. If you take him, maybe there won't be that big a deer anymore. And so there was, there was a, a process of a selection of which which animals was uh, more likely to be not as affected in the chain of life as others. But nowadays, you know, it is the, the giant horns. <laughs> it, is, it is that, you know. It's um, a crazy thing that uh, trophy hunting has done to people because we're not reliant on that as a food source. Hunting and fishing have now dropped into the categories of recreation instead of sustenance. You know, where the tribes are still in the mindset of sustenance uh, and, the, and the reliability of um, the process of salmon from ocean to the high mountain streams and seeing the indications of whether or not it's a good year or a bad year. You know, now it seems like the uh, Indian people who have fisheries are indicating that uh, we have big problems with water. We have salmon coming back upstream that are uh, deformed. We have them coming back upstream that have bugs in them and uh, different growths that are on them. These are all indicators that our water system is collapsing. Not that the fish are having a bad year. The overall we have to pay attention to. Do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> you know about the water project in California. Uh, we believe that it's all one project. You know, you have the Delta Tunnels that they say is a separate project that's going to be built big enough to divert the entire river of the Sacramento. They say they won't, and I asked them why. They said, we don't have the permit, but they're going to spend the money to build them big enough that they can. Why would they do that if they're not going to? It's a waste of money to build them oversized. Then you have Sites Reservoir, which is right out here um, in Williams. 
that they're going to build. It's on the uh, governor's list of wet water projects for Prop 1 funds. There's no way to fill sites. There's no running river uh, streams, year-round streams, that would go into sites reservoir to fill it. They will have to pump from water from the Sacramento River to fill sites reservoir. In order to do that, because they are pumping as much water out of the Sacramento now, that they couldn't possibly pump more to fill sites. So that brings us to the Shasta Dam raise. And they have to build the Shasta Dam higher so that they can catch more of the runoff water, which will then be shipped to sites to fill sites uh, during uh, winter, year, winter months and start uh, building up the water storage at sites by the overflow uh, from Shasta and Oroville. But uh, it doesn't make sense. You know, uh, Shasta Dam is over 85 feet, uh, 85. Excuse me a second, Chief Colleen. If you want to stop and take a drink of water, then I could circulate the rest of the evaluation. So oh. Do you want a drink of water? There's water. Oh, sure, sure. Clipboard. No, no, no. The water is gone. <laughs> I don't know how you guys are drinking that. Right? Which is a sad thing. It's like, oh my God. Poor thing, have to drink that water. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we went to San Diego one year and they were hosting a uh, spiritual wellness conference at the San Diego Hotel right there at the town and country up by the San Diego River, right? And so I had some of my young people with me, and they asked us to do a women's blessing down by the river. And so we said, oh, yeah, you know, we could do that. We'd love to do that. We went outside, and it's like, where is the river? <laughs> and then we walked around the hotel, and we couldn't find the river. And then they came out, and we said, well, you know, we'd love to do that blessing, but we can't find the river to set our stuff up. So we walked around the other side, and they said, this is the river. And it's this chocolate brown stream running by the hotel. That was the San Diego River. And um, if you've seen um, McLeod River, it's pretty pristine. I mean, you can see to the bottom of it. It's nice and cold and bubbly and a lot aerated. It, it smells good. It tastes good as compared to that. And so our young people looked around and thought, Oh, <laughs> little mouths dropped open. It's like, wow, that's a, you can't, you got to be kidding us, right? You're kidding us. That looks like a sewer ditch. And then we saw upriver, there was somebody fishing. And they said, oh, they're not going to eat anything out of there, are they? <laughs> but it was a shock, you know. And then I showed them the, the L.A. River. It's like, what? <laughs> what happened to this? You know, and, and the, the things that people become accustomed to doing and a seeing uh, impacts our ability to change anything. You know, and for them, it was like, oh, they need to free that river. You know, get that concrete <laughs> out of there. But uh, when, when you have populations that grow accustomed to it, it's, it's harder. It's like the frogs in the pot. You know, they don't, they don't see a difference. Generation after generation, it's just the way it is. Um, but as far as the Shasta Dam raise, um, they want to build it 20, 18 and a half feet higher, which will essentially be like 22 feet higher. They'll have to do a clear cut around the lake, cutting all of the trees up to 25 or 30 feet from the new water's edge. Um, and they say that that uh, would be the keystone to the California water fix. But in reality, you know, we, we have sacred places still along the river. We've lost 26 miles of the river the first time they uh, put the dam in. 
They've never really uh, justified that. There's an act of Congress that says they'll give us like land to live on, move our cemeteries, and give us an infrastructure uh, to continue our way of life. Well, none of that has happened. They did uh, move 183 grave sites to a central place in uh, Old Shasta, I mean, not Old Shasta, but um, Shasta Lake Cities, where it was supposed to continue to be our cemetery. So now they have transferred that land into the BLM land banks. And if you know anything about BLM, they don't allow burials on their lands, uh, yet it's a practicing burial place. So we have a problem there, right? Um, but in addition to that, uh, there's been no land given to us, so we have no land on the McLeod River, and they'd had no, uh, in fact, there's a letter that says, the best thing you can do for those Indians is to move them out of there. Why give them an infrastructure to live in a place that's unlivable? So that, that's the commissioner of Indian Affairs to the president. And so none of the other uh, guarantees of the act happened for the 26 miles of river and a way of life. And you have to realize that the Winnemum uh, never came down to join in uh, the new developments of modernization. <laughs> they always remained on the river and always wanted to remain on the river. Well, at that uh, building of the dam, whatever happened to the salmon happened to us. The salmon were no longer allowed to come back to their homelands and neither were the Winnemum. And so that uh, in itself uh, is an issue that's over here and everybody goes, well, they don't even name that act of Congress that allowed them to fill the lake on top of our lands. But, you know, there's problems with legal, legal remedies and all that kind of thing. But the other part of it is, is that uh, we asked them, if you did raise it, even if you raise it 200 feet higher, because that's what they were in, initially intending for the dam to be 200 feet higher. It's supposed to be an 800-foot dam. They stopped at 602 feet because uh, the war was pretty much over, the money was running pretty thin, uh, and they ended it, right? But if, even if they did, the water that would be captured in Lake Shasta would not make an iota a difference in the percent needed by the people in the South. It'd be a drop in the bucket of the need to um, address the issues of how we're using water, All right? But the other issue that people don't think about, too, is, is that um, in 1850, you know, the people came to the state, why? Gold. They came for gold, and they came in the hundreds of thousands into the state, and that's what happened to the Indian people is that there was an actual policy by the, ver the first governor of California to exterminate all the Indians. So you could make your money killing Indians, men, women, children, babies, whatever, or finding gold. And so that was the, that happened. So there was a lot of uh, mining uh, that was exercised on a lot of the rivers, including the Sacramento River. Uh, the McLeod River, we were still, what they say, wild enough to keep the miners out. So the miners never got to uh, dredge up the McLeod River. They never got to find out whether or not there were pots of gold on the McLeod River because of the fierce nature of the tribe that was there. And because it was far enough away in a canyon that uh, they couldn't, you know, they didn't just encroach and live like, like on Dunsmuir. That was the way of the railroad. And so the, the tribes along the, I mean, the Sacramento River going that way had less of a chance because there were so many uh, people coming. And they kept coming and they kept coming. On the McLeod, you would know they would be coming up on the buckboard, right? <laughs> you could hear them. <laughs> and so they could be stopped more easily by the, the tribe. And, the, and they did. But on the Sacramento River, there was uh, a lot of mining and uh, for nickel, for copper, for iron, uh, and they did a lot of hyd hydro mining at that time as well. And, and you know that there's a hydro mine up there called uh, Iron Canyon 
that continually bleeds the poisons that eventually in the wintertime in a wet year, it'll dump over and it goes down the Sacramento River. Nobody wants to talk about that. And they don't want to talk about that it continually bleeds and they don't know how to stop it. They've tried a number of methods and they can't stop it from bleeding. It's left over from the mining time. Well, on the Sacramento and under the Shasta Lake, there are also hydro mining activity that took place and all of that metal in, um, is exposed to the lake. And as long as three rivers run down to fill Lake Shasta, there's a movement of sediment that has moved to the bottom of the dam. And so nobody's talking about the 60 foot of toxic sludge at the base of the dam or what to do about it, but us, right? We're saying uh, if you dredged out that 60 foot of toxic sludge that's on the bottom of this lake, you would have more room for volume of water. You wouldn't even have to build it higher if you took that out. Because you're going you're gonna to build it 20 feet higher and you got 60 feet if you just dredged it out new and clean. And they said, well, we don't know. It would be pretty expensive and we don't know what we would do with that uh, toxic waste. And so you're just going to build it higher. <laughs> you're going to leave it there and it's still going to continue to accumulate, and you're going to put water on top of it. That's the answer. And so, you know, we were, we were complaining to them that uh, the fish have mercury poison. Well, did you test them? It was like, no, we didn't test them, but we see it. We see it. You don't have to be a scientist to know when a fish has mercury poison. You know, e even in the taste of them, you know. And so finally, just this last year, I don't know if you saw the report from, um, I think it was Sacramento Bee or LA Times reporter had talked about the, the Shasta Lake and the mercury poisoning of the fish. Because we have been asking the Forest Service, um, when are you going to put up signs to warn the people that these fish have uh, mercury poisoning? And, they, and that was like eight years ago, right? And we still haven't seen any signs. Because we were asking, well, how many languages will you put that up in? Because this is a, a world-renowned lake that people come up from all over to come here. Not one sign has gone up. Not one uh, meeting about the, uh, what to do about the mercury-infested fish. Uh, still, even after the, uh, the article that came out pointing to that. And so we have problems with the Shasta Dam on a technical, uh, scientific basis, you know, not just us being in the way of another raise of the water over our sacred sites, which affects who we are. How do we remain to be Winnemum when that's the only place that we can go to learn how to be Winnemum? We can't go to Hoopa and still learn how to be Winnemum. We can't go to Cherokee or Arizona and learn how to be Winnemums. We have to be in the Winnemum territory to be Winnemum, and to raise our children Winnemum, to know all that we know about our own traditional territory. So we're affected big time by this raise. But everybody else, you, you know, maybe they don't care about cultures, or maybe they don't care about tribes, and maybe they look at us as a small handful of people standing in the way of millions of people who need water. But the bottom line is, is that we're standing in this handful of people in objection to raising this dam against a handful of people who want to make money off of this. Westlands Water District, Metropolitan Water District, all of the um, GMO farmers, Resnick's Farms, all of these people stand to uh, get richer than they are. I mean, they're powerful enough right now, uh, and everybody, you know, uh, doesn't realize that the Shasta Dam fix is not for the people. <laughs> it is not to give more water to independent farmers. They're still going to buy that water from the brokers at horrible prices. Already um, they're selling water that they get for $20 an acre foot subsidized. They're selling for anywhere from $400 to $2,500 uh, an acre foot, depending on who's bidding at the time and who needs the water at the time. So this handful of people is what we're dealing with, 
but they want to make it out that we're standing in the way of all of the people getting water. And it's like if all the people knew that, you know, L.A. is not going to get any more water than they can buy. And the prices are going to be uh, very, very high. That the small towns like Seville and Alpa and all the ones in, on the corridor of Fresno, Stockton, uh, Foothills, are not uh, rich enough to buy that water. Even the place in Tuolumne, uh, their water allotment ran out. And the Tuolumne tribe utilized their water right to bring water for that town. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had water. They didn't have no more money. They ran out of their allocation. You know, that's how evil <laughs> this water war is going to get. And we don't realize it right now because we think the government is making plans to help everybody. But the government is not putting themselves in charge of the distribution or uh, of that water. They're putting water districts in it, right? And you know that they... Um, have the money to do it. Like everybody said, Diane Feinstein's bill uh, for the water fix was this scattergun approach, you know, to desal, drought, groundwater, reservoirs, raising, you know, it's just this massive water fix. Well, February 10th came out her, her next version of it. Shasta Dam is on it as authorized to uh, raise as part of the water fix, as is Governor Brown pushing the Delta tunnels. Um, and the same thing is true with the Delta. No one has seen a Delta die. If you take all of the fresh water out of a Delta, it's no longer a Delta. It's no longer an estuary. It's an inlet. And when you change that, you're changing this whole flyway system. You're changing all of the fish that are in that that system that need fresh water. You're changing all the plants that are growing within that structured area. And you're changing all of the salmon runs for the major rivers in California. And they say they're not going to, right? They're just going to dig out uh, these two giant um, holes in the delta and place their tunnels down so nobody sees that they're probably as big as this room. They're four-lane highway size um, tunnels. Now they're trying to call them pipes because in people's minds, pipes are smaller than tunnels. And so it's a, a word, <laughs> word play on people too. But they're building them so big that they will be able to uh, divert the entire Sacramento River. And right now the motto of the state is, is that every drop of water to the ocean is a wasted drop. Right? That's the big uh, tagline. And, and uh, Farmers Feed America... Uh, people are fish. It's like, what do you think? The fish are gathering up their arms against you? <laughs> it's like, yeah, the fish are marching on us. <laughs> Here comes the salmon. <laughs> it's like this, this uh, dreamlike uh, enemy. The fish are our enemy. And we couldn't possibly allow them to live. You know, and right now the Delta smelt are uh, nearly gone. And UC Davis here has been charged with uh, rearing them in their um, tanks on campus to try to save the Delta smelt rather than allow them to live in their natural habitat by moving the pumps and diverting uh, the water at different times of year. And instead, the thought is, well, those little fish are just in the way of us growing food for the world. Right? We're going food for the world. Um, but this little finger-sized fish, they say, is our enemy. You know, they're on the last leg, per se. They're like, there was, they have been here for over 6,000 years, native fish to the delta, a necessary fish for the acclimation of the salmon and other uh, species that utilize that delta smelt. And 99.5% of them have given up their lives for the Delta pumping system. And now we just have to go after that last 1% because they're still in our way. And we don't recognize the effect of losing the Delta smelt on the salmon runs uh, on anything. It's like we're so uh, removed from that that the Delta smelt is like 
Nobody catches that. Nobody eats that. Nobody does, you know, it doesn't benefit us right up front. It's not a money maker. And so we don't give them importance. But as tribal people know that the delta smelt is very important to the overall ecology of the entire delta. And that once you ta start taking out these pieces, it's a little, like the little white butterfly. If they poison the little white butterfly, eventually there'll be no trees because they won't reproduce. The same is true of the delta smelt. That's why it's such a uh, disaster, tragedy uh, for them to, you know, not consider them a part of our environment, a part of our system. And then uh, after they do this, after, if they get to build the tunnels, they're going to pull out all this toxic dirt from the bottom of the delta, right? Because the ships have gone in. And wherever the ships go in, there's a lot of toxic waste that's uh, circulating on the bottom. So they're going to build this. And you know what they're going to do with that dirt? They're going to build a wetland. So not only are we taking this toxic dirt out uh, that we shouldn't, but now we're going to give them to the flyway bird system. So all the birds flying uh, up and down our, uh, our uh, sink is going to be sitting in that toxic dirt that they're going to pump water into. And they say they're going to create 100, uh, 100 more acres of wetlands for the birds out of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there's so many things to, to think about and talk about. But right now, you know, um, we've, we've passed out a little flyer. Uh, we're trying to uh, find a champion in the system that would actually... Uh, speak up or help uh, talk about these things, help the tribe um, and the salmon. Our main focus is bringing the salmon back because we believe that once those salmon get back into that river, many things will change. There's a magic that happens uh, when they come back that isn't there now. And so we're crippled in that way, but when they come back, uh, maybe more eyes will be opened Maybe more hearts will feel the difference. Uh, maybe more people will understand our connectedness with our Mother Earth. And, and that um, we are not smarter than they are. That's what, you know, we have to recognize. All of the science and all of the studies on the salmon uh, are incomplete and are only on the terms of what human people want to think. But salmon have more information about our systems than we do. And we should follow them. And so we're following the salmon. And we're trying to open up that waterway so they can come back on their own and utilize that entire system and have major effects on climate. When they swim up and turn the rocks over and they deposit uh, their um, nutrients, the whole mountain, the whole system is better. The meadows retain more water. The trees retain more water. There's condensation that happens in the water system that people don't count, that are major water performance throughout the year. You know, people are trained to only look at a reservoir and say whether or not we have water or not. But did you notice that our reservoirs, especially Folsom, was like a dirt, dirt down there 11% full, a mud hole, while reservoirs in the southern part of the state we're completely full. What kind of drought is that? That leaves us with no water and fills the lakes down there like they got rain and we didn't? Yeah, it's a selective frame that makes you think that we're in dire drought state. But we're not. We're in dire um, choices. People are making choices about our water and how to use that water and what they can do. But we really have to uh, rethink a lot of things. And, and a lot of it I don't understand because they say, you know, California feeds the entire world with almonds. Or China gets major almonds from the state. Uh, so it's important to grow almonds in the desert. You know, <laughs> I don't know, but if you drive up I-5 I corridor and you see all these brand new little trees coming up, in the desert, you know, something is wrong with our thinking. And so there needs to be a paradigm shift 
of what we're capable of doing and what we need to do. And we have to wake up. You know, we have to start uh, participating with these water district meetings because I can guarantee you that um, just like the sites project for the governor, they have a uh, chief of staff for that. That chief of staff is an employee of the um, Westlands Water District. And so uh, these things, they say there is no conflict of interest, but uh, even on the governor's staff, they have another water district, Westlands Water District person uh, designing uh, the plan for the governor. You know, and so we have to wake up and start realizing that um, we shouldn't have that. I mean, it's like um, the Frankenfish. I don't know if you heard of Frankenfish. They're developing this. Well, they have the guy from Aqua Bounty who is the lab that's developed Frankenfish on the Food and Drug Administration uh, leading the approval of the Frankenfish. It's like, <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd be better with a homeless person in there. <laughs> <laughs> who has a sense of, like, his environment. He has a sense of, you know, getting by and knowing uh, how, to, how to survive. You know, uh, there are decisions being made by people who will never have to live it. You know, just like on Mount Shasta, you know, we're fighting Crystal Geyser. Um, and people utilize Mount Shasta, you know, around the world. But they get the fly-in. They get to do whatever they're going to do, and then they fly home, and we're left with whatever runs off of Mount Shasta because we're all downhill from there. So we have, to, we have a lot of work to do, but I think um, the more people start talking about things and start caring about things um, and start with their own homes, stop using fertilizer, stop using Roundup, stop using antiseptic dish soap, you know, start uh, buying more organic get away from GMOs because the money issue pushes these guys to continue what they're doing. You know, I think there was enough uh, issue in the organic uh, processes that these major GMO companies uh, started buying up the GMO companies, I mean the, the organic companies, so that their supermarkets can now, uh, you know, but they're still getting all of the profit from that and they're still regulating how much organic food can go on the market at what price? Because we used to all, all be organic and it was pretty cheap. But now organic, anything that's good for you, costs a lot of money, right? And so uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming out and being here and inviting me. Uh, there's a lot of things that churches across the, the nation, around the world, uh, really need to start sitting down with the indigenous peoples who are struggling to protect their homelands, but it's not only their homelands, but it's a, a signator for the world's existence. Yeah. Right, yeah, the, the, other, the other issue that uh, you need to be aware of that whenever you join in uh, defending Mother Earth or seen to be, is, is that you'll have a number of enemies and you'll be targeted and we go through that. Uh, uh, we've survived a couple of uh, crippling blows to the tribe. Uh, and they remain, you know, they continue to keep us poor so that we can't really make an impact. Um, and so social media and talking out like this is our basic uh, weapon to defend and try to educate and help all of us understand, uh, you know, what your circle can do. So thank you very much.